Mark Twain, An Introduction Samuel Langhorne Clemens was born in 1835 and is far better known by his pen name, Mark Twain. An American author and humorist of the first order, he is perhaps most famous for his novels The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, written in 1876, and its sequel The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, written in 1885, and often described with that mythic line, The Great American Novel. Twain grew up in Hannibal, Missouri, which would later provide the backdrop for these great novels. Apprentice to a printer, he also worked as a typesetter, but eventually became a master riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River. Later, heading west with his brother Orion to make his fortune, he failed at gold mining and instead turned to journalism and found his true calling as a writer of humorous stories. It's on these shorter stories that this volume dwells, his wit and humour sparkle from every page, his craft evident with every phrase and punctured target. Twain was born during a visit by Halley's Comet and predicted that he would go out with it as well. He died the day following the comet's subsequent return in 1910. These stories are narrated for you by Stuart Milligan, who masterfully makes Twain come to life. The Carnival of Crime in Connecticut by Mark Twain The Facts Concerning the Recent Carnival of Crime in Connecticut I was feeling blithe, almost jocund. I put a match to my cigar, and just then the morning's mail was handed in. The first superscription I glanced at was in a handwriting that sent a thrill of pleasure through and through me. It was Aunt Mary's and she was the person I loved and honored most in all the world, outside of my own household. She had been my boyhood's idol. Maturity, which is fatal to so many enchantments, had not been able to dislodge her from her pedestal. No, it had only justified her right to be there and placed her dethronement permanently among the impossibilities. To show how strong her influence was over me, I will observe that long after everybody else's do stop smoking had ceased to affect me in the slightest degree, Aunt Mary could still stir my torpid conscience into faint signs of life when she touched upon the matter. But all things have their limit in this world. A happy day came at last, when even Aunt Mary's words could no longer move me. I was not merely glad to see that day arrive. I was more than glad. I was grateful. For when its sun had set, the one alloy that was able to mar my enjoyment of my aunt's society was gone. The remainder of her stay with us that winter was in every way a delight. Of course, she pleaded with me just as earnestly as ever after that blessed day to quit my pernicious habit, but to no purpose whatever. The moment she opened the subject, I at once became calmly, peacefully, contentedly indifferent. Absolutely, adamantly indifferent. Consequently, the closing weeks of that memorable visit melted away as pleasantly as a dream. They were so frightened for me with tranquil satisfaction. I could not have enjoyed my pet vice more if my gentle tormentor had been a smoker herself and an advocate of the practice. Well, the sight of her handwriting reminded me that I was getting very hungry to see her again. I easily guessed what I should find in her letter. I opened it. Good. Just as I expected, she was coming. Coming this very day, too, and by the morning train. I might expect her any moment. I said to myself, I am thoroughly happy and content now. If my most pitiless enemy could appear before me at this moment, I would freely right any wrong I may have done him. Straight away, the door opened, and a shriveled, shabby dwarf entered. He was not more than two feet high. He seemed to be about forty years old. Every feature and every inch of him was a trifle out of shape. And so 
while one could not put his finger upon any particular part and say, This is a conspicuous deformity. The spectator perceived that this little person was a deformity as a whole, a vague, general, evenly blended, nicely adjusted deformity. There was a fox-like cunning in the face and the sharp little eyes and also alertness and malice. And yet, this vile bit of human rubbish seemed to bear a sort of remote and ill-defined resemblance to me. It was dully perceptible in the mean form, the countenance, and even the clothes, gestures, manner, and attitudes of the creature. He was a far-fetched, dim suggestion of a burlesque upon me, a caricature of me in little. One thing about him struck me forcibly and most unpleasantly. He was covered all over with a fuzzy, greenish mold, such as one sometimes sees upon mildewed bread. The sight of it was nauseating. He stepped along with a chipper air, and flung himself into a doll's chair in a very free and easy way, without waiting to be asked. He tossed his hat into the wastebasket. He picked up my old chalk pipe from the floor, gave the stem a wipe or two on his knee, filled the bowl from the tobacco box at his side, and said to me in a tone of pert command, Give me a match. I blushed at the roots of my hair, partly with indignation, but mainly because... It somehow seemed to me that this whole performance was very like an exaggeration of conduct, which I myself had sometimes been guilty of in my intercourse with familiar friends. But never, never with strangers, I observed to myself. I wanted to kick the pygmy into the fire, but some incomprehensible sense of being legally and legitimately under his authority forced me to obey his order. He applied the match to the pipe took a contemplative whiff or two, and remarked in an irritatingly familiar way, "'Seems to me it's devilishly odd weather for this time of year.' I flushed again, and in anger and humiliation as before, for the language was hardly an exaggeration of some that I have uttered in my day, and moreover was delivered in a tone of voice and with an exasperating drawl that had the seeming of a deliberate travesty of my style. Now there is nothing I am quite so sensitive about as a mocking imitation of my drawling infirmity of speech. I spoke up sharply and said, Look there, you miserable ash cat. You will have to give a little more attention to your manners, or I will throw you out of the window. The mannequin smiled a smile of malicious content and security puffed a whiff of smoke contemptuously toward me and said, with a still more elaborate drawl, Come, go gently now. Don't put on too many airs with your betters. This cool snub rasped me all over, but it seemed to subjugate me too for a moment. The pygmy contemplated me a while with his weasel eyes and then said, in a peculiarly sneering way, you turned a tramp away from your door this morning, I said crustily. Perhaps I did. Perhaps I didn't. How do you know? Well, I know. It isn't any matter how I know. Very well. Suppose I did turn a tramp away from the door. What of it? Oh, nothing, nothing in particular. Only... You lied to him. I didn't. That is, I... Yes, but you did. You lied to him. I felt a guilty pang in truth. I had felt it forty times before that tramp had traveled a block from my door. But still, I resolved to make a show of feeling slandered. So I said, This is a baseless impertinence. I said to the tramp, There, wait, you were about to lie again. I know what you said to him. You said the cook was gone downtown and there was nothing left from breakfast. Two lies. You knew the cook was behind the door and plenty of provisions behind her. This astonishing accuracy silenced me, and it filled me with wondering speculations, too, as to how this cub could have got his information. 
Of course, he could have culled the conversation from the tramp, but by what sort of magic had he contrived to find out about the concealed cook? Now, the dwarf spoke again. It was rather pitiful, rather small in you to refuse to read that poor young woman's manuscript the other day and give her an opinion as to its literary value. And she had come so far, too, and so hopefully now, wasn't it? I felt like a cur. And I had felt so every time the thing had reoccurred to my mind, I may as well confess. I flushed hotly and said, Look here, have you nothing better to do than prowl around prying into other people's business? Did that girl tell you that? Never mind whether she did or not. The main thing is, you did that contemptible thing, and you felt ashamed of it afterward. Aha! You feel ashamed of it now. This was a sort of devilish glee. With fiery earnestness, I responded. I told that girl in the kindness, gentlest way that I could not consent to deliver judgment upon anyone's manuscript because an individual's verdict was worthless. It might underrate a work of high merit and lose it to the world, or it might overrate a trashy production and so open the way for its infliction upon the world. I said that the great public was the only tribunal competent to sit in judgment upon a literary effort, and therefore it must be best to lay it before that tribunal in the outset, since in the end, it must stand or fall by that mighty court's decision anyway. Yes, you said all that, so you did. You juggling, small-souled shuffler. And yet, when the happy hopefulness faded out of that poor girl's face, when you saw her furtively slip beneath her shawl the scroll she had so patiently and honestly scribbled at, so ashamed of her daring now, so proud of it before, when you saw the gladness go out of her eyes and the tears come there, when she crept away so humbly, who had come so, oh, peace, 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 blister your merciless tongue. Haven't all these thoughts tortured me enough without your coming here to fetch them back again? Remorse, remorse. It seemed to me that it would eat the very heart out of me. And yet, that small fiend only sat there leering at me with joy and contempt and placidly chuckling. Presently, he began to speak again. 